recording Torbjorn and Marchin D3D distributed enterprise on a 3D printer moving forward. So question, question number one, do we have an explicit value pop proposition for the first workshop if we're using a Prusa Mendel? And it seems that the value is we will be a workshop that for one, we do it in one day and we are yeah. looking at bed leveling. So a replicable model around one day as well as automatic bed leveling, which is something that first of all, to if you look at the details of the 3D printing world, we do not know of anybody who builds a working printer, including calibration and everything else and, and settings and all that. We don't know of anybody who first of all builds it in a single day. And second, do we know of any workshop that's got automatic bed leveling as well? So that so that are, that appears to be a, a unique value. It's to communicate it is a little tricky, I, I would say, because uh, someone who's not familiar with three D printers won't may not appreciate that as much as we do. And um, and who cares that? Oh yeah, it's, so it's actually a three D printer. It's got a bed leveling. Someone who doesn't know about it, they they may not really see the total value in it. So there's a little challenge in marketing there. So I think. Um, the way it has to be positioned has to be thought about clearly regarding what what exactly is it? how do we frame it mm, I think maybe the or bed leveling we don't even need to mention like uh, why, why the printer works uh, so fast we can just say uh, it will be easy to configure uh, mm -hmm. so we so we yeah, so we don't we into technical details. We can just say it will work in one day, and we will configure it. And we have cho we have made design cho choices so that it's easily configurable. Right. And to to talk about analysis of the competition. First of all, who's running workshops? Do we have a good list of that? Mm, I've found uh, a couple of groups giving workshops. It's not an exhaustive list, of, of course. Uh, let's see where I put okay. that. Well, so, so um, Joshua emailed me asking, okay, when can he get on these conference calls? I think the thing is, since we're nailing out so many of the technical issues, it might not be the time for him, since he would be more on, on the organizational front and publicity and everything else, event organization, which I think he's good at. But maybe, what if we tasked them with, with doing that, the study of industry standards, which here is who's running 3D printer workshops, and maybe get an exhaustive list. That would be very valuable, because then we can say, okay, there's so many uh, 3D printer workshops out there. First of all, many have come and go, including ours. I mean, when we did the Lulzbot kit, well, we went because the kit was no longer produced, so we couldn't do it. And yeah, it's that thing. So for us, we had an experience where, okay, we did it, and then we quit. Um, many others have the same experience where where because it's so difficult it's hard for anybody to continue it how do you get a revenue model that works uh, where you actually have a real product but I think the assumption here is we offer a product like any commercial printer the simple thing being that we produce it and I think like for our clarity I think that the main difference there is it works as opposed to oh it'll take you a week to configure and and, and kick it in and and actually make it work. Settings, print quality, and so forth. Is that is that the right track? Am I on the right track? Yeah, yeah. I think you are the just just focusing on making it work and keeping it that simple. Mm -hmm. I think is the right way to go. So I mean, for example, uh, Pr Prusa when he ran his his workshops, I mean, did they work at the end of the day? Or people always had, there's always a bunch of people that didn't have a product and they had to mess with it and maybe even out of the workshop, some people never used the printer. Yeah, I don't know. We should ask him or other people giving similar workshops. Uh, I don't know uh, how big a uh, percentage actually gets a working printer that they use. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know the 3D4EDU 
that's a longer workshop. It's three or four days. I, let's see. Well, the the Michigan Tech people, Jerry yeah. and Zalone, running that workshop. We know that everybody comes out with a working printer, just like us. We went to that workshop. Uh, one of our yeah. people went to that workshop. Uh, we got a working Delta, but that's three days. Uh, it might be even longer. It might be like four days or such. Yeah, um, four days. Four days? Yeah, I mean, that's a long time to, to get a printer to work. I mean, that's not everybody has that time. That's not a consumer grade activity because we're saying in a single day, when you can do that on a weekend, one day, that's a consumer grade activity. You can afford that in terms of time. Even if you have a crap job that makes you tired, you can you can afford a, a day to <laughs> to uh, uh, relax and print, build a 3D printer in a supportive environment. Okay, so I would say yeah. I would say definitely let's look at let's look at the development um, template. So D3D development, and in it we have the development spreadsheet. In it should be one item in the enterprise part, which is um, so. Let's go into uh, there's the development tab right there. Process management, event organization. So event organization. Since we're running workshops. Um, well, I, ju I just want to add to the value proposition mm -hmm. that we should consider the development in um, consumer 3D printers right now is that uh, it, it's a race to the bottom. Uh, prices are getting lower very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the, the tip to get on the reprap forums is like you get what you pay for. If you buy a $200 printer, you will. You will spend the, the extra thousand dollars with your time, right? So maybe we can frame it like uh, people get the opportunity to buy um, a cheap printer and making it work uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan joined us. Jonathan, sorry, we actually reconfigured the calls. Yeah, uh, Torbjorn is now, and Alec is later. We're talking about the strategy, the product strategy here for the workshop. How do we frame it? Um, so in a development spreadsheet, let's document that I, one of the things that's outstanding here, there's the, the event organization spreadsheet part. So if you go to the D3D development page, um, Jonathan, let me give you a link if you want to take a look at that. There's, a, there's the spreadsheet, development spreadsheet in there. If you click, click the event organization tab, I think we should add two very specific items. And, and I thought there's two very, very significant economic development items that we need to include right now. And that is an in-depth analysis of industry standards for the workshop, who's doing it, who's succeeding. Uh, so a, a comprehensive search. So we've got a, I think we should have that within two weeks. So we want to advertise the workshop by February 19. So we give people a month's lead time. And if we can say very clearly, okay, who's offering workshops? Why is, you know, people heard about 3D printer workshops all over the place. I know that uh, Hammerspace here, for example, I just found out in Kansas City offered that, but no one showed up and they weren't good at marketing or something, or, and there was no sustainable economic model. So once again, uh, we want to improve on that and really learn all the lessons from everybody, and, and that could be part of our research, um, research proposition to see how these open source enterprises can really take over the mar certain markets, which is our very ambitious goal. Um, we have to study what's been done and why people are failing at delivering a, a continuing, recurring, self-sustaining, economically model for 3D printer builds. So in the development spreadsheet, I would add, so I'm going to go edit it, and there should be something like analysis of industry standards in there. If not, we should add that. So I'm going into that spreadsheet. Um, and... Torbjorn, I think you have um, access to the edit privilege there. Uh, yeah. Since you're the product owner, you should. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's Which see if I can. I? Let's see. I, I'll share it with Jonathan. Right. We'll Ground research. Okay, so there's. Stand. Right, so so event organization, 
background and research study prior art other workshops yeah okay right there so that num that we should really put in red uh, that's a very important part and we need to do that like right now possibly we can get Joshua to help us with that so we should we should ask him about this and Joshua since you're gonna watch this video in the future because you watch these videos he actually follows up and he's been watching uh, following up with the progress uh, we'll ask you to see if we can uh, do research on that meaning what's a comprehensive list of other workshops that are happening especially right now or that have happened and and what what were their results did people show up how much did they charge what's um, what's the result did everyone walk out with a working printer what kind of experience was it a fun experience or frustrating how many days did it take etc so we, where do I put my partial list here? Uh, so, so the well, the you click on a link, link to work product in column C, link to the column C three. Has got the list already. So we can add to that wiki page. Uh, is that is that clear? Uh, no, I'm not sure. The link is with the development and. Go to the spreadsheet and go to event organization tab, which is the third tab. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, event organization is the third tab on the bottom. I'm pointing that as I'm recording the screen here. So that's development, process management, event organization. I guess we should put. I just put it into the second place, event organization, so that that's the um, active yeah. after development. We gotta event, organize an event. Okay, so you're there. I don't see Jonathan there. If you want to, Jonathan, if scream if you've got trouble getting in there but it's a second tab event organization study of prior art so that's where we want to put all of our you know all that we discover in terms of workshops that are ongoing as a study of industry standards and that makes a case for marketing it's like okay who who's doing it why are we better and so if we can simply say well we're the only workshop that is actually um going to be ongoing well we can't say that at the first workshop because it's not ongoing but uh, without the track record but uh, we can see okay our goal is to make an ongoing workshop and to spread that and here's exactly why like if we can make the claim like you said if you pay two hundred dollars for a 3d printer and you s spend a thousand dollars of your time troubleshooting it well that's a twelve hundred dollar printer so how do we actually do a two hundred dollar printer or a four hundred dollar printer that is a two thousand dollar printer you know so that's that's the question for us um we can say so yeah does that make sense yeah okay uh so i would say second item would be now this is about sourcing so the sourcing um sourcing problem so and that fits more with not so much event organization as much as just business development in general like the enterprise aspect of the 3d printer in general but let's put yeah. it in say it again what i just said yes okay yeah. okay but you had a question um right so the thing to do is determine what are the you know like we said the prices of the 3d printers are going to the rock bottom there's a race to the bottom uh, well what is that baseline how much if you go to china or whatever the sourcing is that where everybody gets parts what is the bulk price that you can get so if you if you buy bulk components what is what are we competing with because that will allow us to say okay in our model um, we cannot get those prices so low if you know depending how we do it how we source it how much lead time there is but the baseline we need to know is what's the price at the bottom because then we can say things like okay well if the price at the bottom is that then we might have to make our own parts or I mean we're going to be developing the tool chain by going back into the technological recursion meaning uh, after some time building the parts ourselves uh, or with basically we're developing the supply chain this is like Japanese success Six Sigma um, we're gonna develop the supply chain as we go forward 
So, yeah. but we have to know oh, what's what the baseline is. So I'll put. We're going to. Go ahead. Yeah. We're going to have to make uh, tough decisions if we're aiming for producing ourselves or if we're aiming for making it uh, as cheap as possible. Um, that that has been a um, uh, point of. Uh, confusion in the rep rep community, whether we should go for the cheapest parts or the most self-produced ones. Right. And, uh, stuff like that. That depends on our right. value proposition and how we put this. So this is really market segmentation and like what are we after? What is our brand? What is our marketing strategy, product strategy, all these uh, business terms that uh, actually will like to uh, refer you to uh, so I'm going to refer you to two important studies. So one, uh, J and Jonathan, what's the name of that page? Core Core Training. I'll just go to my log too. Yeah, it should be uh, uh, Core uh, Business Core Training. I'll, I'll pull it up. Organizational Core Training. Uh, there's Torbjorn. You talked about. MOOCs. Well, here's a here's a MOOC from the Wharton School at UPenn, one of the best business schools in the states. But they have a MOOC on marketing. So I saw that. I started watching it. I actually ended up watching all of it because it was very useful. So I would suggest you take a look at that, and this will talk about this this market strategy, branding. Segmentation. Okay, nice. Take a take that course uh, on page two. You will see the the first course is marketing. It's free if you don't get a certification. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, with marketing, there's marketing, strategic marketing, segmentation and targeting, brand positioning, elevator elevator speech, mm -hmm. experiential branding, and we've got a highly experiential brand. Uh, there's actually we're actually well positioned on like when you talk when you see this uh, these discussions you'll see how uh, we're actually quite well positioned to succeed here with what we're doing. Okay, second thing is there's some seminal work regarding open source product development that I'd like to get everybody on the same page with. So if you go to the OSPD page on the wiki, I actually spent a bit of time looking at that. And Jonathan, that's I think I mentioned that to you. If you go to OSPD, there's some really seminal literature that we need to need to look at, and the one that I found very compelling was um, the seminal paper, which is the fourth link in the literature, the seminal paper on new product development, lean production, and the role of modularity, and that really nailed some of the things that we were talking about uh, regarding modularity. So basically, I mean, that's the that's kind of like the the science or or the seminal uh, leadership thought leadership on the topic. I actually thought that we should uh, reach out to the some of the seminal thinkers there uh, and approach them with strategic development on the GVCS or just set specific products because I think they might have a lot of insights. But that's that's really good and a seminal book on. Um, Modular design is the design rules, the power of modularity. They refer to that in um, in that paper, the from manufacturing to design. So, yeah, take a look at that. Um, really critical stuff there. And above that, you see the open source product development milestones, where I'm seeing several different fronts that we have to tackle, from design to CAD to documentation, collaboration architecture, to enterprise and build. With, with some of the key milestones we want to achieve at open source ecology. Like once we have that, we can roll out um, pretty rapid rapid design. But getting back to, that was a little distraction. So getting back to, so one was the MOOC on uh, marketing and business. And here, the other stuff is the open source product development methodologies. But um, getting back to the distributed enterprise, the, the baseline component prices, um, component prices so basically the concept there is um, 
based on um, so now we're running with the Folgertech Prusa i3 um, we can take a look at that bill of materials and pretty much start because it's, it's got a detailed bill of materials you can take a look at all those parts and source them and basically get probably like the, the idea there would be to get three vendors uh, pretty much in a bulk setting like okay if you order a you know a pallet of this rail or a pallet of these uh, stepper motors what's the price so basically going to China since that's where it's all made or going to other sources where they're made whether it's the United States or wherever but what are the existing prices of the different components because that will allow us to see okay if you're the you know if you're the Walmart here's what you can do at the lowest in the lowest sense and at the limit what we're gonna see is that um, we can compete with it the whole the whole concept here is that by technological recursion by going back to making parts including advanced parts like more advanced parts like stepper motors or anything or the extruded rails um, we can make a decision at some point if, if called for to make the machine that makes those parts so we can take a look at it first of all what we're competing with and, and not be scared of that it's like if it if if survival or like uh, not survival but just uh, getting that enterprise to be ethical or you know to, to, to put on its right track ie to, to provide open competition or open collaboration which whichever word you want to choose uh, in, in order that these things are not monopolies and we distribute production far and wide we're gonna have to develop the machines that produce the different components so in a deeper game what are we at present competing with what are the base base prices and do we then choose to run our workshop model by saying oh we're actually gonna go to those cheap cheap suppliers or we're gonna do it differently we have to make a very conscious decision as far as what we want to do and that that comes out first by studying what are the prices and where we go from there so without the data uh, we can't go anywhere uh, we need to find out the base prices so basically you take every single component in a kit the Folger tech kit which um, let's see under D3D development there should be a link to that so uh, probably at the bottom uh, we should have Prusa i3 development and in there we've got a link so basically off the the D3D development page you go to the link which is the Prusa i3 development there you have a link to the Folger tech kit basically just go to every single part and source it give three to five i say five would be a a good number and in the sense of sourcing from original manufacturers the critical fields would be order time price minimum order quantity and any other special restrictions or whatever but the delivery time and minimum order quantity and uh, price are the three items that we absolutely have to have and maybe we could put in some other things in there as well if we're more clever but that's that's what I see as on a business development part of this is uh, uh, this would actually help us make a very clear proposition when we go to advertising by by uh, February 19 by February 19 pretty much we have to have the materials out so in other words in the next few weeks uh, starting like next week we're talking about an event announcement um, location securing probably at Kaufman Foundation so by the way for anyone who's watching this um, this is where it's gonna be this is um, factory farm is not the Hilton yet so we're gonna go to the Kaufman Foundation Conference Center uh, so I just pulled up the link to that these numbers uh, is Joshua gonna, going to ma make all this in investigation of uh, bulk, bulk uh, oh I don't know so prices. we can ask we can ask him but that's um, if he'd like to perhaps get involved in some of the organization leading up to the workshop that would be a great thing to do if he would have the time and also if we build so we're gonna build the machine here tomorrow 
we're gonna yeah. see if he wants to replicate that. But but I think he should wait until we we are finished with the build to see where we want to go from there. Just as we talked last time, so we can make a request to anyone who's watching this video to get involved, or to Joshua if you're watching this video. We'll see who can help us out on this. So definite lots of legwork to do but that's very much needed and this sourcing information actually will be quite relevant to many down the stream projects like all these bolts screws uh, power supplies all of that i mean the same thing will apply to many other projects um having that solid baseline right now would be a really good idea jonathan any other comments on that any thoughts on, on which part in terms of the, the the sourcing or in terms of just everything yeah um more like um going taking this project seriously in the long term I, I think it's clear that the importance of those baselines just simple market research here uh, that's important right yeah. yeah i mean i think definitely open hardware development is a process and we're definitely experimenting with social production and that social production is going to have you know, an outcome that one is can be measured economically, and I think that's the ideal thing is that we're trying to prove. Hey, can you be profitable? And doing the distributive enterprise is 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 that example. So the the hardest part is that there's not a lot of examples, and so we're we're setting that example of you know open source mm -hmm. social production and research and development. Most research and development that we have out today is is you know obviously closed source, and there's a lot of secrets and a lot of things that people hold to themselves but I mean ultimately a lot of that information and the competitive advantage that they have is that you have a lot of a higher frequency of that model and so we're creating yeah. a new model that's gonna that we're gonna have to prove and demonstrate so yeah and I thought another thought about this is there's actually a positive outcome of this doing this baseline research if that kind of information becomes very very transparent I think that's actually a competitive so-called competitive advantage for us because Anyone else who's who's doing this work needs to become honest. You know, like we say, okay, look, your materials are three hundred dollars. Why are you sh selling this machine for thirty-three thousand? You know, that kind of deal. So I think um, this whole uh, transparency in a sourcing chain will be very useful. And down the road, of course, we have to look at what does that supply chain look like for places around the world like here we're dis discovering that for America but what if you're in India what if you have your own sources of steel and extrusions or whatever or you're in South Africa or wherever or in Europe you know what are the other sources so eventually this whole whole baseline information of sourcing would be, would be a, a global database um, but we can explore that for I mean the easiest places right now which are China and other places and the known manufacturers right now. So, so getting a directory of that, that, that could be a nice crowdsourcing project in itself. Yeah. But anyway, um, that's, that's, um, so let's see if we can get, um, get some help on that, the baseline component prices, as well as the study of prior art and other workshops, as we talked about. But let's talk about, maybe, let's maybe switch to the technical discussion, which is what... Um, Torbjorn, maybe I can ask you, I think what, what's really useful is to get a, a, a super clarity of when we go forward, what the decision tree we're settling with. And so I, do you have, I mean, do you have any clarity on where we're going right now as far as for some of the technology choices that we're making? Um, and, and no, not more than before. Yeah, I think... Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking just uh, using the Prusa kit for the first workshop and uh, trying to have a um, uh, bed leveling as e easy and as good as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I, I hope we can make our own design work. Uh, that won't be the same kind of printer. It will be a much, much, much more easy to build printer and. And it will be maybe more expensive. Right. So there's a lot, right. uh, lots of other design decisions in in that printer. Yeah. Right. So so how best um, as we go forward? Because we did start the tech tree of choices. So if we go to the development spreadsheet, let's see uh, tech tree of choices. Um, 
that should be put into the the spreadsheet but I, line number 40 is the tech tree of choices we start looking at it so we should fill in what that line is but basically as we're going forward here i'd encourage you to to as we move forward just fill keep filling this out you know like for example design rationale does that design rationale still hold today and and that, that, therefore we can put yeah, I mean, we can put a level of completion column D, which is like say, okay, three. We you know we we worked on it a little bit. Um, tech tree of choice. I know we've got a little bit on that. Um, the bill of materials. Let's see. That's very much incomplete, but we started it, so maybe put a one next to that. Um, 3D CAD, obviously, without the design, we don't have that, but. We do have the open scat, so it's you know we've got a little bit on that. Requirements. I think the requirements are pretty um, pretty stable. Like, let's see. But we should make an explicit li link to that uh, in a spreadsheet so people don't have to look for it. I think we were done. Like we're probably like at eight with the requirements. Hey guys, look, we're three percent done. It's great. Um, <laughs> let's see industry standards. Um, that's just a basic analysis of what 3D printers exist out there. But for us, the, uh, on the enterprise level, the industry standards are who's running workshops. Yeah, which would be in the other tab. But yeah, yeah, let's let's continue uh, leaving a good paper trail. Um, I think to get very clear, like, okay, so I've been doing a lot of work on, maybe I can encourage you to do this maybe as some of the next steps. Uh, if you have a roadmap, uh, if, How much of a roadmap do we have right now? As as you saw some some of the roadmaps here, like I did put put one up for the 3D printer. Um, yeah. I don't know if you subscribe yeah, to any of that, but that's kind of like the long term thing. Uh, but I yeah. think what what might be worth it is if you did one that you can see how the how how you iterate and what kind of features you see coming. So maybe I don't know, maybe maybe try doing a roadmap for um, this. Would that be useful? Or what what do you think is the most useful thing you can do right now? Outside, of course, of, of getting into the design, because there there is some things on the um, kind of the project management organizational front that we we can do to facilitate the process. I, I'm I'm thinking about uh, three things that must be in place for my project to succeed, and it's um, getting the people, the participants, and the mm -hmm. instructors, mm -hmm. uh, inspectors, and uh, getting the hardware so that we have some hardware. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, my project to succeed, it's not very crucial which hardware or how much we know about that specific hardware, uh, as long as we can get some data, because the project is really about getting data about workshops so that we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think maybe... Um, uh, well, there's also the... Trying to make workshop as real as possible, uh, by just getting hardware and getting people is, is it should be our focus. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And of course, the quality of that hardware that we build, put together, that will determine whether people are going to be showing up. Because if there's, um, yeah, of course. When we have to deliver certain things, like one day that actually works, and some other features, uh, probably like auto bed leveling, the first iteration, yeah. Yeah, I'll try to. Um, I agree on the on the bed leveling part, and I'll I'll continue that uh, work on uh, mapping out all the choices, all the uh, how we're gonna do that, mm -hmm. and start uh, prototyping in a few days. The actual bed leveling uh, mechanisms. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I also think we should think uh, we should write up why why that is so important to reach the overall goal of of distributed enterprise, uh, keeping the distributed enterprise in mind and and uh, yeah, making it possible to measure if we did the right decision. Uh, why is it? Why is it critical? Or not. What's our understanding about why it's critical? Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 uh, line yeah, why is bed leveling so important? Yeah, yeah, we should 
Yeah. The answer, I'm asking for the answer. The answer we know right now is that that turns it from a hacker printer to a turnkey printer, right? Yeah. Right. That that single aspect there is essentially that. And that's, that's yeah, that's it. Um, okay. Maybe in some sense. Yeah, I think the most useful thing is to uh, think about all those all those decisions mm -hmm. how to get closer to the distributed enterprise. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The, 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 the the sourcing yeah, and all that stuff just needs to work. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um. Yeah. Yeah. In the first workshop, so when sorry when so we're evaluating how how long it takes to build the Folger tech kit which we're gonna build tomorrow um, yeah. and then optimizations and it's it's kind of a it's a bit of I think the first workshop is a bit of a hard sell until we get um, well yeah I think we're all the work is in front of us we need to build it we need to see how many people show up first of all to the first workshop um, we need to see how much you know what the real value is like I think that background research there the workshops research I think is pretty important too um, I yeah, mean I, I just mean, getting the data out of the, the workshop it's a really uh, it's a difficult task the first workshops right right um, yeah and then the, then the thing the thing that's left is uh, okay so the marketing strategy is there anything we can say about that hey Jonathan uh any insights on that? I mean, um, one way to get more people to show up is to to put in a lot of effort on the marketing part. So maybe one of the, maybe strategically speaking, one of the most important things for the first workshop is to spend a very significant protocol, uh, significant effort on the marketing aspect. Um, and then how would we do? How would we do that? And who's going to do that? Um, because that that in itself could be a a significant job. Jo Jonathan, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Mm. It depends on your approach, and you know, again, how much time that you have, and of course, um, really identifying your market and your audience. And so, I think that's a huge part. Okay. Um, so, again, it's getting the communication lines out to people, yeah, and making sure that they're yeah. effective, and making sure that the timing is right. So, those are some key elements there I uh, yeah, knowing your audience and I think uh, yeah like the number one for marketing right now is um, starts with a build tomorrow it's like without doing that and first of all seeing if the the 3d printer works right I mean that's that very big step right there and how well does it work what improvements we have to make and then based on the improvements we're able to make up to the, the workshop who exactly are we reaching because I think we can decide to reach okay we're just we're so good that we actually uh, reach the average consumer because oh yeah it turns out all this stuff just works or we're going to focus on a much smaller segment of the population which is those people who who we have to act who actually understand the deeper vision behind the project which is uh, yeah, a much I, smaller audience and i think I that's think we need, yep we need to flag that we're aiming for the Distributed enterprise, and that's why we do this. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we're going to aim at very, very narrow group. So, so In do we beginning. call? Yeah, no, I, I think that's where we're going, uh, which means it's a harder. Lot of it's about the experience. It's a lot of it's about the experience that people are going to get to be able to do something that they didn't believe was, is possible. And I think that today people have money. And they have a lot of things that they can buy, but what they can't buy are exper experiences. That's something that you have to create, and people that create good experiences, and I think that's what the 3D printer workshop is going to give people, an experience that, you know, going to the Walmart and buying a 3D printer or going somewhere else to buy a 3D printer, you're not going to get. So I think we're going to, we can definitely capitalize on that experience. Okay, I agree with that, but that's different than what Torbjorn is mentioning, which is that it's going to be actually those entrepreneurs that run run the workshops in the future I think that's actually um, kind of the background so I think I don't know my suspicion is that the way we have to position is this is just playing the experience so it's not the experience for the hacker I would say 
I would say, from what I know, the average workshop on building a 3D printer is for those hackers. And they're already in that culture. But I think what, what we want to offer, the dogs are going wild there, I need to check in. I think what we're offering is... Um, the entrepreneur experience. Well, not the entrepreneur experience, the, the, maker, the maker experience to non-makers, I think. I think that's what we're selling. Because we're not selling the maker experience to to makers. I think we're because those people already have their 3D printers. There's 80,000 that Prusa created. Um, I think we're selling the maker experience to non-makers and and being very clever about how we do that. I don't know. I think that's because the entrepreneurs they're going to come through eventually. But I don't think that's the market that's going to cash flow the this um, this enterprise. Okay, also, they're going to come about. People are coming to have an experience to make something that they never thought was possible. I agree I with in that. General, on a base, base term, yeah. No, I agree with or that, and that's before. that's what we've learned from our workshops already at Factory Farm, is that the 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 raving remarks come from those people who say, "I never thought I could do this." So it's not the hacker that's coming there. It's like the hacker knows, "Oh yeah, we'll hack it and we'll make it work." Here it's people who are new to that whole scene, and I think that that should be our complete angle, because uh, I think that market is the experience market, the the market that connects very deeply to the the deep missed need in today's society, and that's to be a non-consumer, to be productive. Uh, that part which is uh, buried in today's consumer culture, which people all have, um, depending on how much aware of that they are, for how much they reach out for that. But everyone has it, and I think we can play to that. It'll be our strategy to get people to this. From experience, uh, getting people into the 3D printer lab at the university was much easier with first-year students than with second-year students, because first-year students they want to like get new dreams and uh, they have lots of time. Mm -hmm. So like catching them was so much easier. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, in general, uh, catching younger people with these ideas have been easier to me when I yeah. Like, maybe we should aim for young people, or maybe people who like hate their job, or or uh, or really old people too. Yeah, maybe. So I think what this well, discussion well, leads to is we need to. I think we really need to get get clarity on our market segmentation here. That's. Um, that's what I'm getting out of it. We have to get very clear who our audience is and, and uh, test that and, and refine it to the point where... Because yeah. it's not like... I got an email back from some of the people at Kaufman Foundation yesterday and saying that, oh, well, nobody wants 3D printers anymore. They want the CAD software to design with 3D printers now. Uh, but he was speaking for the, the, the hacker, the more the entrepreneur community, which I don't think is... That's not the audience we want. Not the... It's not the entrepreneur that we want. They're, an entrepreneur is going to think like, oh, 3D printer, you know, there's just another one, right? Uh, I think it's the, it's a different person than that, I think. Yeah. Now, of course, they're yeah, going to emerge. Yeah. They're going to come, yeah. but from a different different angle. Yeah, we need to find the, the people that think um, with this knowledge I can do stuff. I want to have this knowledge, not oh, I want man. to have this machine. Take a look at your uncle as the case. Hey, tell that to uh, Jonathan. Hmm? No. Oh, <laughs> the internet uh, eats up half, half of Martin's words. So I didn't hear what, what he said. He, he said to explain something. I, I didn't get it either. But um... uh, Okay, may, maybe he meant I should explain the thing I just explained him. Or did you hear it? No, no, go ahead. Uh, I said we should try to find the people who, who think um, I want this knowledge uh, because they start dreaming about what they can do with the knowledge and we don't right. find the people who want the machine and just start dreaming about what to do with the machine. He also mentioned somebody else that you, I guess, knew or had talked about or something. He mentioned somebody to talk about, so I don't, I don't know if that was in reference to that. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Have, have you like 
tried to build a, a lab and recruit people or something similar before? Um, not, not particularly to more of the technical side, but maybe perhaps I've done a lot of um, organization and you know managing of people. So I mean, definitely, you know, in terms of a technical sense, um, help do some of the workshops. So in terms of logistics. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Martin, who was the gentleman you were talking about that for him to describe? I His uncle who that. got into 3D printing and started a business. Awesome. Yeah? Do you want to repeat that story for Jonathan? My, my uncle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, I think that's a powerful uh, story. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's my, my uncle who got unemployed. And so he, he just needed something to do. So he went to the, the, the what do you call it, state office, who, who were helping unemployed people find work, and he didn't find work for like half a year. And then he just uh, bought a 3D printer with his last money, and he started printing these little plastic products, and, and drove his car around, started selling them, and it worked. So he has lived off of his 3D printer for, for nearly three years oh, wow. three now and I've, I've just helped him with the most technical parts and he runs his printer 24 7. <laughs> see isn't awesome. that an awesome story yeah that's amazing <laughs> yeah automation i mean yeah, we should so you know actually we should that we should document that and t tell them more about it um as a case you know here's our user user um uh, intended audience. That's that's an intended audience. Good example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if we could yeah, even absolutely. go with with t making a case study out of that, how is he making money? What? Who is he approaching? Is is it actually working automatically? Like, ma let's make a business case study for what the real opportunities there are. I think uh, I think some case studies. Um. Let me yeah. Let, let me actually add that to the the event organization if we could come up with some further case studies of how people are making um, different ways people do make money with 3d printers I mean like for example Joe Prusa is a case of course he's the hero but he made a lot of money doing workshops right and travel the world I don't know if he made a lot of money but he certainly traveled the world giving workshops that were funded all his travel yeah he makes money now <laughs> Yeah. From success. I have some case studies because um, I've printed the rep wraps for, for the friends that I thought maybe could use them. And they have used them in wildly different ways. Um, it's really hard to predict what people are going to do when they get a 3D printer and the knowledge of how to use it. You know what? If we focus on that in our marketing, like we, we show people, okay, this is about distributive enterprise, so we better show some good cases. There'll be excellent marketing material there. So we focus on people yeah, going for the livelihood and going for um, kind of like transition from the regular economy into a, a more creative economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really true. Um, yeah. Maybe I should together those stories indeed indeed let's see if we can collect them and maybe let's see if um joshua can help us do some background work on that as well if, if he's willing to do that um okay so let's uh we need to wrap up pretty soon but let's um two things so one let's get some of the actual enterprise development experts on this call next time so let's talk to a person like jeff jeff moe or colby I don't know, Jeff Moe is good because he can actually tell us about the sourcing issues. He, but I'll, I'll email him, see if he... Uh, he's the CEO of Lulzbot. But we can see if, if he's willing to talk or maybe he can give us some hints about the sourcing issues because he's dealt with that and he, he tries to source from America as much as he can uh, for his work. So, so that would be a great conversation. Uh, if we have really relevant issues, like for example on the marketing aspect, um, or like the case studies, I don't know if there's any experts that we can bring in, but I think definitely Jeff is one. We have a very relevant question on the supply chains, and um, I don't know who else we can try to get 
into, pretty much into a working meeting. We're actually working out some of the issues that we're trying to solve here. I mean, Colby would be a good good guy as well. I don't know if he has any decent insights on this. But um, Jonathan, any other thoughts on key key SME contributions that would be needed that would help us here? Well, I'm thinking about you know in terms of the roadmap, what uh, exactly do, do we have a roadmap for this? I mean, I saw the one that you had, and I was just not to distract from that, com that, that question as far as SMEs. I, I really don't know at this point, but, but uh, are we on track and in, and in progress for March 19th? Uh, what we do have is is the D3D development page, and if you go to the wiki on there, there there is a critical path there. So maybe we should just take a look at that quickly. So Jonathan, here it is. Um, D3D development, there's a critical path at the, uh, pretty much at the top there. So... I would say I'm behind schedule um, on my part because of the the change of apartment. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll work on the um, plan workshop flow of modules, design tests, test rigs, write instructions. I haven't really done the work I should do on this, these four uh, top left. So I was just saying that when we bring in an SME that we know exactly what we need and uh, what our needs are and to communicate them effectively so that uh, if there are any gaps that they can fill, then uh, we can use their time very, very much wisely. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here the thing is really evaluating the Prusa I-3. Um, I mean, really, the, the the discussion right now is technical. I think we we've got a decent hand, handle on uh, well, as far as the positioning, the the brand positioning. I think we're decent on that. I I don't think anybody can tell us more than we we are regarding those issues. I don't know, but really, the technical issues are what what need needs to happen. But we don't have a very detailed plan on uh, on uh, resource needs and uh, time consumption per task and uh, detailed tasks. Because um, I haven't really known, uh, defined the project good enough to, to make that list. Is that something you want to do? Uh, we, we should do it I think because it's easier for people to contribute and it's easier I think so. for ourselves to know if we're on track. How is that different from a critical path? It's just more detailed? Just more detailed, yes. I think so. That's actually what I'm doing right now for the tractor, uh, the heavy equipment construction set because uh, we're planning. So yeah, to, just to give you a parallel, what I'm doing right now with, with the heavy equipment construction set is we're going to build a tractor in February here using existing modules so it's pretty much we've got all the modules we're going to reconfigure build a totally different prototype but with that we're breaking down like very simple okay here's this new module like literally a weekly module schedule that we're then going to advertise that we will then introduce in design sprints and um, and webinars so that we can have a continuous schedule throughout the year later on so yeah that's an example I'll just it's a little different example but how if we actually have the the tools for people to contribute uh, such as enough direction or instructions like for us for me on the um, tractor construction set that's gonna be some design manuals and part libraries like if people have that they can definitely contribute by remixing and, and using FreeCAD to manipulate it so we need something equivalent here where that would be a list of um, very specific tasks that we can so yep. that's what you're talking about some much more specific tasks and I, mean, I think the the development template I mean if we could refactor the development template so we can take out things from there that are really needed and just put them on a you know how do we do that how best to do that because really it needs process management like somebody needs to say okay this is the process we know that we have to develop all those things that are in a development spreadsheet already 
So there's some protocols that we could use for uh, hmm, how to do that effectively. Uh, I've got some help from uh, Andreas yeah. the project planning. Uh -huh. And he always asked if I, if I will make a work breakdown structure and specify um, mm -hmm. resources needed and time needed for uh, all the tasks. And I just haven't been able to because I haven't uh, got grips of the project before like last week. But uh, yeah, uh, since he since he says we should do that, uh, it's probably uh, a good thing to do. Since he's I like that. That's, that's what well, one of the things in terms of the charter, um, as far as our timeline and milestones. So we're on we're on track for that, correct? Mm, not the the top ones. Not the define workshop reproducibility plan workshop. But uh, the bottom ones, the order of proofs ev uh, evaluation kits, prepare prototyping, those are on track. So uh, my thesis stuff is not on track, but all the other stuff is on track. Yeah, I, I like work breakdown strategies, basically taking it, it's kind of like what I'm, should take that model into consideration when I do the the tractor construction set, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very tedious, but it's very good. But um, WBSs are good, but they, they are sometimes hard to do without a your first iteration. But yeah, mm -hmm. they are definitely yeah. useful. Yeah, it take time, just like the roadmaps and all that. All that planning stuff takes time, but I think it's worth it because then you can say instead of kind of like going back and forth to okay, what do I need to do. It's like, okay, you've got a path cut out for you. Mm -hmm. mm. Workbreakdownstructure.com <laughs> <laughs> We did that for Microhouse 4, no? Pretty much, yeah. Um, without knowing it's called a work, really knowing that technical... We should get a little more technical and understand really why it's important how to do it in some basic... Like what to put in there yeah, and what well, not to do. You quantify each hour and each unit, so you do a lot of chunking for each uh, module, and mm -hmm. then you actually quantify how much time it is your guesstimating is going to take, and then documenting how much time it actually did take. So. Hmm. Mm. And then the critical path is supposed to pop out of that. That. Um, that chunking and. And making uh, the explicit what uh, depends on what uh, dependencies. Yep. So explicit time guesses then verify verify by recording the time, so you actually learn from it. Right. So that gives your baseline, mm -hmm. as you were talking about earlier, is even for market share. But you're doing your baseline as far as your first iteration. It's hard to know. It's hard to predict something that's never been done, unless there is a baseline. So. Again, doing work round breakdown structure is just a guesstimate at first, and then that gives your baseline, and then you can work from there of doing process management and improving process management, which if you have good knowledge management, then that's good, but if you don't have documentation, then it's, <laughs> well, you know, can, can be very much a loss. But from there, you can find your flow and your bottlenecks and, and do a process improvement. But, you know, for research and development, um, it's, it's a little bit more challenging because there are you know, a lot of tools, um, but we're creating them, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, you need to understand the project really well to make a good uh, work. Right, it's a little structure. tough. Yeah. Or at least, but, you know, if you do, mm. I mean, the main the technical aspect, right? I mean, if you know the build process by first building it first and prototyping it and then getting that, that process down, I mean, there was a book written about scientific management, and the, the, the guy who wrote it was, anyway, back in the 50s, but the whole idea was that he actually broke down tasks and even physiological movements of what would be the fastest to actually do something. So, you know, maximizing efficiency, but, you know, that kind of generally runs a lot of uh, manufacturing. Yeah. Okay. Mm. 
Yeah. Scientific, what did you call it? Scientific planning? Scientific, uh, management. Scientific Man management. I think the thing that's missing in our in our methodology is 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 that understand or like that how how much to weigh like what what the proper sequencing of the whole development process is cuz I mean it's iterative so it always goes in circles so it's hard or maybe it's like that's it it's just hard and and you really have to you know how do you teach a process manager like what step to do next and you know what's relevant what's not you know, it would be nice if there were a formula, but then you get into waterfall. You know, you do one thing after another. Here, it's like you do all steps at the same time. And the key is that you involve other people. So, like, the, the biggest thing we can do is call, like, Joshua, for example. We called him out, right? Or uh, Jeff Moe or whoever. Um, that's the only way, uh, that's, like, the way to be able to address things because there's always more tasks than you can do. So the only thing you can do to address that is bring in new resources, you know. Um, so I think maybe kind of reframing along the idea of bringing in other resources is a good good framework to have. But um, how to do that? It's you yeah, know, that's, that I is an important. I tried one. To, to make the work breakdown structure the other day, and I didn't succeed because I didn't understand the project. Then I try to zoom out and just um, formulate why I do this and that kind of helped uh, prioritize yeah the main aspects of chunking is, is that you find out you quantify what is going to take the most time and then of course from there you break that and you do that you segment and, and you break those chunking pieces into smaller segments and then you can quantify that. I mean, and of course, giving examples would be great. I mean, it's like if you're building, baking a cake, you know that you need your made ingredients, you know that you need to first, you know, put the eggs in a certain sequence and putting all your ingredients in there, putting it in the oven before and not after, you know. So I, I think it's just, again, going through the, the whole process and having an experience and understanding the experience. Um, so I think the key part is being able to build the printer and know what printer you're going to build so that you can replicate that experience for someone else and then and do process improvement to allow for it to be efficient. Um, so I think, one, don't overthink it, but you know, go ahead and just find out the 3D printer that we're building, decide on that, and once that's decided, then find out the fastest means to be able to replicate that. Yeah, except we're finding out the critical part right now is getting that build happening. Uh, preparing that today and doing it tomorrow so we get good data and then go from there. So, I mean, that's the bottleneck here. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't scientific management replaced by Six Sigma, pretty much? Like, scientific management yeah. is kind of like the waterfall and then you get onto the the test-driven design, the Six Sigma, the, the rapid prototyping kind of style, uh, modular design. I, I would agree. Yep, I would agree, and that's where there has been an you know, evolution of that kind of thinking, you know, a growing of mm -hmm. that thinking from just uh, an, an industrial type of thinking, and, and of course, as like you had referred to before, the command and control mentality, which is more of a militaristic mentality rather than an improvement in mentality. Right, you know? right, from, yeah, basically from waterfall to constant improvement, iteration, test-driven design, learning, yeah. Where the manager in a Six Sigma or a learning organization, uh, they foster the the occurrence of learning, not the execution of tasks, as opposed to the Taylorism, the scientific management, which is the manager manages tasks. In uh, the next iteration of that, the manager manages learning. Yeah. And one of the things about um, the manufacturing sciences and my own personal experience, even some of the work that I do is, is that also process management and dealing with the service industry. So dealing with the human element, I think, is a key part there. So um, that's, I guess, the, the next layer that's built on that is the human aspect. Um, given that we do have now more of a service industry than an actually manufacturing industry, and of course we're trying to integrate both of those. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I think let's leave it at this for now. We got design to do, uh, the printer to build, get some data off of that, and go from there. Um, I think ref uh, as soon as we can, like next week, starting on uh, really the publicity, which is getting a clear statement of who our audience is. That's our next next uh yeah mm -hmm. mm. okay mm. Yeah. so our main goals for the next between now and the next meeting build a printer <laughs> how do you plan uh, collecting data from the build so take time so timing uh, probably do a uh, camera that you do as uh, yeah thinking about that camera time-lapse camera I think um, okay. if not that just do the time-lapse would get you a capture of everything the question is can we set up a time-lapse on I think I've got I've, I, yeah I think I've got a way to do it I've got this other older camera I can do I'll prepare that uh, because with that you can go through that pretty quickly and see like in, in practice how much you can just go through the time lapse and see how you can measure the times off the time lapse knowing that so many seconds is so many hours and so forth mm -hmm. that's really good that's a yeah. good that's a good thing as opposed to like taking records where you write it down because writing it down a lot of times you might miss stuff um, so this is the time lapse is not intrusive it allows you to take a rapid assessment of build time um, then of course the the big observations which are going to be like okay this calibration stuff yeah those those other elements w which we know we're we're in trouble for because uh, this build is is our blood and sweat build right yeah your first comments will be very valuable as well like when you're finished you will have some comment on what surprised you and so on yeah, um, my current assessment for the record is that it will the mechanical will come together, then we're going to get around to the electronics, and we're going to get way slowed down. One, we're going to have to find good documentation on the overall product. Like first, like just an integrated manual for how to put the entire thing together is going to be hard to come by on the electronics part. I think the mechanical build, uh, I think the instructions that they have are, are pretty clear but it's going to be pretty much about putting resources together like one pull together all the instructionals in the most effective way which are right now pretty inefficient like for example the detailed build instructions don't have a good video with them like in a video you can see like bam okay quickly there's a lot of like missing steps for me off the written instructions right now and on the electronics forget about it once you have to do the, like the measuring with a multimeter and then unplugging it and and uh, getting the run and then plugging it again that's just going to eat up a bunch of time i'm not i'm not looking forward to it right now so outside of this i don't know if i'm going to have any surprises i know i'm going to be frustrated with um with the electronics calibration and then the issues what i'm expecting is things like how do you actually get it to be straight and align like little details there there's going to be a bunch of fiddling with uh, probably like how do you whether it's the end stop or something else where you're doing the aligning part, that's going to be a mess. I don't, I don't see how it won't be because I really haven't seen any compelling documentation on it. Um, like I think I don't know, Torbjorn, does does documentation how to get everything set up right uh, at first front outside of just doing it and messing around and going back and forth? Does does something like that exist or? There's there's, there's so many pitfalls and the, it's there's so many different people. So there exist people who can write, read the manual and get it right the first time. I know it has happened, but maybe uh, 99 people out of 100 will fiddle around with something, get surprised by something, and um, most manuals are really not good enough. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming the manual, even though it's rather complete, it's going to suck. I mean, there's no question about it. Unless it's been taken through an iterative version and improvement process it's just not going to be good it, and that's that's i think exactly what we're going to provide we're going to provide all that little streamlining we're going to take it through so many iterations until it's 
it's pretty turnkey. And I think the, the concept that we live by is the sufficiency criterion. Once it's good enough, it's just good enough. But we have to get to that good enough part, which I don't think... Uh, right now, all I know is I'm going to search for the instructions on a various part of the 3D printer in different places. Um, okay. And I'm going to look for that. I'm going to look at that tonight so that I'm ready for the build tomorrow and kind of know what to expect. But... Um, mm -hmm. I know it's. I'm not looking forward to doing that research because it's going to be all over the place. I'm going to look at like a hundred sources to put together this printer, given that it's a, my first build in. Um, wait, when's the last time I tried to build one? That was years ago. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar. I haven't done this, so it's going to be a great experience to see. Like, okay, from a person who actually knows something about production engineering on, on heavy machines, what's what's the pitfalls here and and I could see it already, just the, the, the way that the documentation is put together. I mean, it's, it's obvious. It's, I mean, it's just not this, it's not this super, it's not good documentation. It's, it's got a way to go. Um, Should we plan on having a meeting uh, um, tomorrow? Soon after, after the, the printer? Yeah, you should start sketching the, the manual. Yeah. Yeah, what we should do is actually, you, we should have you participate in this build tomorrow remotely as much as you can and in fact we should actually uh, publicize that so I should probably blog it uh, Facebook it tonight but we'll just have a video camera up here and uh, you can watch the entire process oh yeah so actually it might be a good idea to put up our spy cam the like the thing we had for the <laughs> aquaponic greenhouse the IOT the internet camera I think we might put that up if not just the the Google video, just that which we've done before, we were we had remote collaborators and we did a build instructional real time as we were building it. So I think the more the merrier. We should actually invite invite Joshua and whoever else can make it to tomorrow. Uh, we'll set it up yeah. on the table here, make it visible. Uh, people can can come in and out, but otherwise we'll be going at it two of us in parallel. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is do the breakdown. Say you have two people. When we have two people here, how does it? How long does it take to build it? So just just divide yeah. the tasks most efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just uh, it's just mail mail me the the time, and I'll log on. Yeah, yeah, should do it probably. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we're assuming it's gonna take like ten hours, at least. Yeah. So I mean, we gotta get get to it. Yeah. Okay, probably like 10 a.m. or so, our time. Uh, 10 a.m. or earlier. We'll see. Okay, uh, that's a big, big milestone. Big day tomorrow. Build. <laughs> big yeah. build of a small machine. <laughs> and the first thing will actually be so I didn't take it out of the box, but the box was a little damaged. It, it, they taped it up because it broke and broke, so they taped it up. So I'm first. I'm hoping that everything is not damaged. So uh, mm. that's the number one thing. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, let's keep going. But we got to raise some stink on this. It's basically, like as I mentioned, we got to keep making noise about it. Uh, the more people we involve, the more of those many, many steps we can actually get accomplished. So we, we have to, I think that's our, in our SWOT analysis, that's our weakness right now. We haven't really reached out enough for enough help. Um, we haven't published this enough. We haven't made this public enough. I did publish the some of the videos on Facebook, but I think we need to make a more deliberate call, possibly even a, a deliberate video with me on a on a mic saying, "Hey, we're doing this. Let's." Uh... Yeah, I might make a little video for tomorrow, for tomorrow's session. Just invite people to it, so they can pipe mm -hmm. in. Nice. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So, uh... So until tomorrow then, um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks, and we'll publish this video online too. See who who will uh, join the team. All right. Sorry. Okay. Okay. See you tomorrow then. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Tomorrow.